welcome here for day three at the 26th scientific annual meeting of the EAO, the European Society of Osseo Integration, together with CEPES, the Spanish Society for Prostodontics. We're here live in Madrid from our little online congress studio. And we're going to learn all about what to do with patients with hopeless, hopeless implants. That session is about to start in, uh, in, in 30 minutes. So you might be wondering, so why are you guys already broadcasting? Well, that is what Online Congress is. We have our studio here backstage where we talk with some experts about the context of this session and how we can bridge the gap between the highly significant and scientific content being presented on stage back to the clinical practice of, of, of regular dentists around the world. And I'm glad I don't have to do that all by myself, but I'm here joined by two uh, very honorable experts in the field. Oscar Gonzalez from Spain, and Frank Swartz from Germany. Welcome, guys. Thank Welcome. you. Now, for some of our viewers anywhere in the world who don't know you guys yet, could you briefly introduce yourself? Okay. Uh, hi. Thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure to, to be with you. Well, uh, my name is Oscar Gonzalez. I'm, I'm here from Spain. I live here in Madrid, although I, uh, I'm coming from the south. And, um, well, I'm, uh, I normally do my, uh, my private practice uh, in the field of uh, implants and prosthodontics. So I have uh, uh, to touch both fields. Yeah. And that's what basically I do. And you really have a, a practical uh, background. Absolutely. But also collaborating with the uh, universities, research and, and teaching. So We're pushing the field forward. And we're trying to do our best. Well, thank you. And, and thank you're you. here to help us today to, to, to bring context to this session. Next yeah. to you, Frank Swartz. Uh, Frank, who are you? <laughs> so first of all, uh, I became a big fan within those two days. So um, <laughs> it's a tremendous setup. So thank you for being here. Yeah. So um, for me, it's um, more or less the same. I have a scientific background. I'm working as a full-time professor at the University of Düsseldorf. It's located in the western part of Germany. And um, my basic research is focusing on exactly this topic. So on the complication rate and um, infections around implants. So this has become a huge topic. And therefore, this perfectly meets my my scientific yeah. and clinical background. Yeah, yeah, must have been why you were selected to be the expert in this session. <laughs> Maybe. And if you're new to uh, Online Congress, let me explain you uh, how it works. So in a minute, we're going to explore the topic and see the, the, the dilemmas, challenges, and, and why this is so relevant for us. Then we're going to go follow the session on stage. And after that, you get exclusive online access to the speakers because they will join us here in the studio and we'll do what we call a speaker's debrief. And that's a combination of both Oscar and Frank reflecting on what we've just heard and, wh and, and what it means. But it's also, we're live. So you can actually go on Facebook right now and type in your comments and let us know any questions you have to our speakers. If you do that during the session, we have here behind the scenes Emma Goldie who will relay your questions to the moderators on stage. So you can actually make an appearance here in the Madrid room in Madrid. Or if you do it a little bit later, we'll take your questions here online. And I would say, let's do a practice run. So if you're already joining us, you could uh, type in a quick comment and maybe you don't have a question yet, but at at least let us know who you are and where you're watching from and if you have the opportunity grab that cell phone and shoot a little selfie of that setting in the world because throughout the last two days we saw people in South America we saw people all over Europe we saw people in Asia so I'm, I'm very curious who you are and in what kind of conditions you are actually joining our online, online Congress today on a Saturday right so it must be we have some people on uh, interesting locations <laughs> Having said that, we, we're going to do a, a quick uh, look back at yesterday. Yesterday we talked about uh, the evolution of prosthodontics, and more specifically where we are in the field uh, in transitioning from the conventional methods to the digital workflow. And uh, we've prepared a little summary clip for you, so let's have a look. <laughs> I'm coming out of the conventional world, and so I need to have um, criteria when I should change from conventional to digital. And for me, the criteria are we need clinical studies who show that these results, which we get digital, have a quality improvement, better patient comfort, economic improvement, and will simplify and faster treatment. 
When these criteria are fulfilled, I change from conventional to digital. So this session was about digital versus analog. What is your opinion? Uh, well, I'm a specialist prosthodontist. I tend to use more conventional um, uh, work, although I can see how the digital workflow is now fitting into our practice. And I think that's the way that we are heading in the future. So the question is, why digital? Right. Right. And Stefan just showed us beautiful conventional work. So for me, the question of why has to be answered with, it's got to be predictable and it's got to be efficient. I'm seeing for analog. Something, some things can be digital, but not so much. And then you can, can construct your crowns digitally and you have your occlusal plane because you can, uh, you can look at the face from all of the sides. Uh, well, uh, yes, I find it really interesting, the difference between the digital and the conventional workflow. And uh, as, as an opinion or what I take from this, from this lecture that uh, in my opinion was amazing, is that the, the digital work, workflow has a, has a long future. We're not robots yet that we place the implant just as we planned. We have to realize that this type of guided surgery and digitally enhanced surgery also calls for clinical expertise and a lot of thought process and decisions during uh, the procedure as well. Digital uh, workflow is a future, but now it is, uh, it must be better. We must a little wait because it is very difficult, very slow and very expensive. For me, selection of material is a very, very important thing if we talk about uh, digital workflow. So when we have restoration on implants, then the gold standard is metal ceramic. And we have very good survival rates are over 10 years, so it's between 95 to 93 percent a survival rate um, for crowns and uh, bridges. And we have chipping, which is not so high, it's between 4 and 14 percent. It's very exciting to see all the new uh, developments that are occurring and the improvements in the intraoral scanners. In order to do this, we, we would have to ask ourselves, you know, in, in which world do we live, considering that there are three different potential worlds. Which is your preferred workflow? Is it the analog workflow? Is it the analog digital workflow? Or is it the digital workflow? And my assumption is, hopefully, that most of us in this room live somewhere in the middle. Because there's no such a thing, I believe, as a fully, fully digital. So you think the future is in the, more in the conventional ways or uh, is it digital? I think it's more in the, in the digital ways because you can, you can solve a lo lo lot of little mistakes you can make with the, with the conventional workflow. So the next part is etiology. Why is the patient losing their teeth? Is it a structural issue? Is it a patient that has advanced decay? Is it a functional issue? Is it a patient that has severe parafunction that's breaking everything? Because this right there will also impact not only our design, but it will also impact what the patient will do with whatever we provide. Is there anything that you learned that is going to maybe change your daily routine? Actually, I would say that I got some confirmation of my thoughts. The way I think, it just uh, proved that digital is okay. It's going to happen. It's in the beginning. And we're learning it now. As the one of the lecturers said, I'm still learning. And that was yesterday's session. And as, as you saw, Ricardo Mitrani on stage, who closed this session actually with the, talk, with, with the statement, which he called uh, a bit provocative himself, he said, we are not making implants for life. Sometimes these have to come out and I think that's a nice bridge into this session today. We're going to talk all about how to approach patients with hopeless implants and I'm joined by Oscar Gonzalez and Frank Schwartz. Welcome. Um, let's start very broad. When are we talking about hopeless implants? What does that mean? Well, that is a very difficult question to answer because uh, the limit is not always that clear. Uh, 
we have to differentiate between something that is failing and something that is really hopeless. Exactly. And uh, this line from time to time maybe is going to be different from every clinician. Also, there is some other factors inside of the different patients that make the two implants that they look similar. We will not consider the same for both of them because they have relative factors uh, that uh, can affect to the future of that implant. So, so beginning from that, from the definition, we have some issues. Yeah. So that's why we have today three big experts that they, I hope they want to help us with that. And, that, and that's where we're going to find. When is failing falling into hopeless? F Frank, so, so let's explore failing first. What, what are key reasons why implants might be failing? So failing, um, from I'm just talking from the scientific background. So failing has been a term that uh, has been tremendously misused. So failing is, is not appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, implants came from an area where we talked about implant survival. So the implant was in the mouth or it was loosened. That means it was movable. Yeah. Over the times we have developed towards uh, success rates. So success means the implant is stable, the tissues are healthy. And um, this is where we are starting from. So we have to think about success and therefore to me, the term hopeless is a little bit misleading. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the point of view. So yeah, sure. what Oscar might consider as hopeless would for me still be a fine exactly. implant. And, and, and what is your different perspective then to be exact from a scientific perspective? Or, or why would you have different perspectives on the same thing? Um, because uh, maybe he has placed the implant. Yeah. So okay. yeah. this changes <laughs> pride and ego. Of in course, there. <laughs> this changes the, the story tremendously. Yeah. And when you um, bring in the patient as well, he might have completely different perceptions. So okay. he can chew. He he's satisfied. Yeah. yeah. So th this is really a task. How to define hopeless? Hopeless. Yes, exactly. And uh, and, and, and do you do, do you agree with Frank? No, no. I, I, the, the, at the end of the day, we have to be in the same page because. Uh, because uh, what we have here is a situation that is, is really concerning as a, as a profession. Uh, I think uh, per implantitis and uh, what's going on with all these implants uh, long term is something that uh, really is occupying our offices uh, and also occupying our research because we don't have great solutions yet for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing more and more preimplantitis, more and more uh, aesthetic concern also for the patient. It's not the same as he has said. It was not the same an implant place 25 years ago. The expectation of the patient is completely different than the expectation of the patients today. Yeah. So wh whatever was valid 25 years ago, maybe it's not that valid today. And, uh, and, and, and what is the key change, you would say? The, the, the failing is not accepted. No, no. The question is some of our patients Today, they do not accept to get an implant which is showing some greatest part, for ah. example. And how many who have seen 25 years, they can buy, they can shoot. They're happy with that. Yeah. Exactly. Then it was purely functional. Absolutely. And now the whole aesthetic yeah. part is much more important. But I guess today, today's session is, is a bit farther than that. I think uh, what we will see, and uh, I hope, I'm sure everybody is going gonna, is gonna to enjoy, is we have seen very, we want to see extreme situations. All those situations where you see them in the office, you say, wow, how are we going to deal with that? What is going to be my decision process? And, um, and what is going to be the outcome? Which is also important. What are the limitations that we're doing today? And that's why uh, from a clinical point of view, but for sure from a research point of view, we need to go along and to, 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 to bring something for, for the community. Yeah, because let's, let's try to size this market a bit. I mean, if you had to guess, or maybe you even know, I don't know, is there scientific evidence about how many, what is the percentage of, of failing implants or problematic implants? So again, failing, um, we have to differentiate between technical failures or technical complications, which yeah. is more appropriate, mm -hmm. or biological complications, for instance. Or aesthetic. Or aesthetic, aesthetic. Yeah, but that's, a, that's a different category because that's more subjective. Then, yeah. yeah, but at the end we can clearly make a statement that at least biological complications, so infections are rather common. And mm -hmm. common means from so the, the initial stages to the more severe stages, at the end every third implant runs into a biological oh. complication within a period of 5 to 10 years. So this is a matter of fact. And uh, this, is, this is scientifically based. But uh, from my side, Oscar, one, one remark. 
must be made. Um, I come from a time where it was um, not well accepted to show implant-related complications at such congresses. So Absolutely. we wanted to show the, the nice outcomes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But in the meantime, I have the feeling that the people are proud of showing their worst case. Yeah, Absolutely. This has changed. In, so. in a weird sense of pride in, in the community. Uh, brightness in, in, the, in the sense that everybody knows that it's unrealistic to, um, to, to discuss on the basis that everything works. So the, real, the realistic scenario is different. So complications happen. And this is the good thing. So we are talking about complications as part of sure, the absolutely. treatment. Exactly. I think you, if you have never uh, had a complication with an implant, you, don't, you have not placed implants <laughs> enough yet. Uh, because once you place a lot of implants, yeah. you have to deal with that. So, so we can identify this is a very significant topic and it's probably relating to anybody who is involved in implant dentistry. Then what, is, what are our key choices or dilemmas here that we then need to face? So, so we've, we come across maybe one in third uh, a failing, hopeless, problematic implant. Let's, let's be careful with the wording here. Now what? Now you have to pray a lot. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, now, but let's explore the options that the <laughs> no. uh, different... Uh, well, um, I think at the, at everything be begins with a good diagnosis. Uh, actually, everything should begin from before of the implant was placed, from a correct treatment planning. And uh, from time to time, we don't pay enough attention to that. But once the problem is there, then you have to, uh, to evaluate uh, the risks and the consequences of treating the implant, yeah. try to keep the implant, which is not always that predictable. And also, in which conditions are going, this implant is going to stay in the mouth? It's going to be acceptable from a functional and healthy and aesthetic point of view? Because it's not the same uh, problem with a central incisor than uh, number seven or second molar. It may be not the same. It may be not be treated the same. It's not the same in a patient with uh, 20 years and a high smile line to the patient that, well, he wants to shoot and it's not that big issue to have something showing off in another situation. Yeah. But again, I think what we're going to see today, first of all, we have to applaud the people who is just sitting in front of everyone showing, listen, this is the problem we're facing. We're going to try to save that or we're going to try to, to, to solve this situation. And this is a big responsibility and I think uh, it's, a, it's an honor to, to have them today yeah. presenting. Yeah. Yeah. Very brave. Before we uh, go further, let me say hello to all the new viewers who are just uh, who have just joined us on Facebook. Welcome, everybody. What we're doing, this is online congress. And in about 20 minutes, the session on stage is going to start. And we're having a little preview chat exploring what this session is all about. And we're live. So if you're just joined us on Facebook, give us a quick shout out in the comments. Let us know who you are and where you're watching us from. Because then, in that sense, you can see how it works. I see that happening here at the, at the, at the desk. And then after the session, the speakers you see on stage will actually walk into the studio and I can take your questions uh, on your behalf to our speakers. Now, Frank, so it's, it's a complex dilemma. What are we going to do? Keep it in, take it out, whatever. Um, what are the key benefits, you would say, of, of maintaining the implant in the mount regardless of the situation? Why should we strive for that? So, of course, we have the dilemma is uh, based on the awareness of the patient. So the difference between implants and teeth is in many ways quite simple. The patient has to pay for the implant and he has suffered a lot to, to reach the stage where he can get the implant. For instance, an injury, so an accident, he received bone augmentation procedures, he suffered a lot. And then two years after the implant has been in function, the question arises, on whether to remove the implant or not. So the patient, this is my clinical experience, is, is not at all willing to lose the implant. And that's the true dilemma. Yeah. So that means in many cases we try to keep implants that might indeed be considered as hopeless, but we have to do our best to satisfy this dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the dilemma is key is from, from a medical and perhaps even from, from an uh, artistic perspective, eh? from, from the craft yeah. of, your, of your profession, you would take it out. But then there's this patient who you don't want to put through this. Exactly. He puts you under pressure. So he says, you, you did something wrong. So um, that's, of course, the intrinsic motivation to, yeah. to yeah. do something. To try to fix it in the exactly. mouth. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and But uh, then I guess you might expose yourself even to bigger risk because if you start working in the mountain, keep stuff, things might erate 
quite quickly, right? I, I see you nodding. No, the, the question is, uh, every time we have to talk about complications, it's complicated for yeah, us, of right? Course. It's, yeah, yeah. it's complicated. Just because we don't have, you have the trick to solve things. Uh, actually, I will say that, uh, and uh, you bring a very, very nice topic, that uh, we have to differentiate when we are working on teeth or on implant. We are good treating teeth. But when we have a complications over implant, we are learning. We are the process to be better when doing that. And, and I guess uh, we still have a long, a long work to do because, uh, because to be honest, every time you have an issue, first of all, if it's your, your problem, it's your implant, uh, you feel such a bad feeling that yeah. for your yeah. patient, for yeah. yourself, for, yeah. and, uh, but especially for your, for your patient. But um, even if it's not yours, the solution is not that easy. And, and it's not the same that you have a problem with one, one implant or two or three, or it's a full mouth, or you have also some medical issues that compromise the treatment of the patient. So, so the, the, the variability, the range is so wide that, um, that it's not... Yeah, that we and, and it's interesting to discover how, how multifaceted this problem Absolutely. is, from, yes. from biological medical issues to, to uh, functional issues, to actually some Aesthetic. interpersonal and, and ego and emotional issues also, yeah. Yeah, both as a professional and for the patient. So, wow, it, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this session. And I want to make a big say hello to uh, Naomi again. Naomi Liao, you're one of our most loyal viewers. She's been with us through, uh, through all the online congresses now. And she's actually taking the opportunity to ask a question to you, to oh. you guys. So um, Naomi wants to know, is there some way to get some predictability of failing implants? This for you. Choosing that word? <laughs> for you. <laughs> Based on case history, are there any indicators that you could see up front that you could say, ooh, these are extra risk factors of failure? Of course. And if so, what should people be looking at? Of course. Um, I would say one of the, the best documented risk factors is, we call it the history of periodontitis, so patients suffering from, from chronic periodontal diseases. So those patients are at really a high risk. So we always try to come up with so-called odds ratios. So what is the, the probability that those patients are at a higher risk? And they are um, within the range of two digits. That means 15 up to 25 yeah, fold at higher risk. So uh, funnily, the smokers have been in for a long period, but now the data quality improves. They tend to fall out so that smoking might not be a big risk factor for periimplantitis. So mm -hmm. this is, of course, just yeah, related to periimplantitis. But so the perio patients are still the most susceptible patients. Absolutely. And then we should not forget where are the expectations from the patient. Yeah, that's that's also something that uh, something that for us it may be valid, for the patient maybe not. Yeah, and uh, you are taking a huge responsibility to save that implant. And, uh, and suddenly the patient is, is not happy with the result. Yeah. And for us, it's still healthy. It can give a good function, but the expectation is not full. And, and, and what are some of the red flags when you talk to a patient up front where it's like, ooh, this, this well, person is having way too high expectations? How much time do we have for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have some time to the session. Starts. How much time do we have for that? <laughs> uh, what is, I, I bet with all your experience, both of you, you have some like, ooh, if you hear this, yeah. you have to start managing expectations. So let's make a test. So yes. the first <laughs> test that we, that we would do when you come to our office, I would ask you a simple question. You are a moderator, yeah? Mm -hmm. Please smile. Hello. Smile in the camera. So, yeah. Oscar, he has a quite high lip line. Yeah. So when you smile, we see a lot of your gum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you are a patient with a risk profile. Absolutely. Ah, okay. Yeah, Absolutely. when you smile and you just see the edges of your teeth, then you are at the lower risk. Absolutely. Yeah, because if anything aesthetic goes wrong, it's exactly. not as much as a, a, of an impact. Absolutely. Nobody sees it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's, That's that simple. Well, Naomi, I hope that answers your question and definitely keep uh, doing what you're doing. And if, if you just joined us, this is how it works. Uh, you're, we're live and you can send in questions both to us here in the studio as to our speakers on stage. Now, all the content we're producing here today is going in, uh, well, it stays on Facebook for a while, but uh, after the weekend, it's going to be uh, in the EAO online library. And this is a resource available to all EAO members, which offers all the abstracts. It offers the e-posters, it offers recordings of lectures, and it offers all the material from the uh, online congress uh, as of Monday. 
Now, the good news is this is normally a members only benefit, but during Congress and the following weekend, so until Monday, this EAO online library is open for everyone in the world. So if you're curious, go to the EAO website, click on online library, create a temporary access account, and you can explore and see if this is something for you. And in general, if you're not an EAO member yet, and you're considering whether or not it's interesting to be a member, you can learn more about this associ association in this little clip. So that's the EO membership. I've, uh, I've just quickly asked Frank, uh, Frank Schwartz, you're, you're a member of EAO. Yeah. Frank, from your experience, what is it like to be part of this community? What does it bring you? So for me, it's, um, it's an unbelievable um, opportunity to, to keep contact with uh, professionals from all over the world. And as you can see, this has become a multinational event. And this is what I'm really enjoying the most. Yeah. Yeah, and, and meet up with peers. I mean, we, we're gathering here over 4,000 delegates from 66 countries. We're gathering also about 5,000 people online in the online Congress, and you're part of that. So uh, thanks for joining. And if you can think of anyone who might be interested in, in the content that we're sharing here, and specifically who might be interested in the, uh, how to approach patients with hopeless, we won't use that word anymore, <laughs> problematic or failing implants, now is the time to hit that share button on the Facebook player or at least tag these persons in the comments so they can be just in time, in about two, three minutes, I think, to join us for the session on stage. Now, finally, we're going we're gonna, to, in the studio, look forward to the session. We're going to listen. Is there anything specific that you guys are going to pay attention to when you listen to these talks? Well, I think the whole thing is going to be um, a big uh, gift for all of us. Um, there are three excellent clinicians. Uh, there are people that with a lot of experience. And, uh, and again, to be there and to show how to deal with that, I think we just have to sit and enjoy and learn. And yeah. uh, for sure, at the end, yeah, they have, I think, short time, like 20 minutes. But I'm sure we will have a lot of questions that we will try to answer after, after that. Exactly, exactly. Let me double check if we get any. No, it's just Naomi thanking us for the great answer. Oh. So she's very happy with that. <laughs> Frank, anything you're looking, uh, looking forward to specifically? Of course, the, the challenge will be on how those uh, speakers um, consider more or less the, the consensus that we yesterday in this specific session on peri-implantitis since we concluded that there are treatment options and uh, I'm looking very much forward to whether they consider those conclusions for their talk. Yeah, because then they would be real, really real-time adopting to the latest insights presented here on stage. They do, they are experts. The, the news is that peri peri-implantitis is treatable? It's treatable and you can get long-term stability depending on the situation and specific circumstances. And I can imagine that has a huge impact also for this topic, because previously we were thinking that wasn't possible. Well, <laughs> what the big side. No, well, no, 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 no. It's no we, we never thought that it was impossible. We, as I think we are learning and we're improving day by day. I think that that will be the message. We, but now we have some, some tools and then we have some research that are helping us to take decisions. That's the most important, to have the right... Uh, the right guides to take decisions. And uh, I think that's the message, and we have to, to keep learning from, from the big guys. The big guys, yeah, exactly. Okay, and how about the future? Because you've explained a little bit of where we're coming from. From 25 years ago, just a functional fix was enough yeah, exactly. to patients getting more expectation, the complexity of the field. Where do you see this, this, this moving in the next 5, 10, 15 years? So, things that are currently changing are the materials that we use. So, th this is not a statement that this is the good direction or the, the appropriate direction, but we are tending to shift towards ceramic implants, to other ma types of materials. And um, this is, of course, an ongoing process. Yeah. I, so, this might be the, the slow evolution yeah. 
but there won't be the big thing, There's the no big, big explosion. No, to. no, I don't expect it. I believe that uh, also integration is not uh, a big issue itself that it used to be. I mean, now the surface has improved, uh, although, although still some questions to answer about which one is better and so forth. We are looking forward to reduce the number of complications to gain long-term stability in our results. I think this is, this is our goal. Yeah. And, uh, and, and for that, uh, I think the, um, that is where we should be working on and we should make research on. And I think this is the key. And, and so basically taking it slowly, step by step. With, and the key word, I guess, what I hear here a lot is predictability mm -hmm. of the outcome. Absolutely. All right. Cool. Well, with that, uh, I think we're about uh, ready to go into the room. Sure. Um, uh, the, 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 the currently on stage, there was an uh, award ceremony going on that has just been finished. Um, so uh, we're about ready to see three speakers on stage. First, we have Massimo Simeon talking about the management of hopeless implants in partially edentulous patients. Then we go uh, going to listen to Juan P. Orgel from Spain, who has based on the topic. Well, well you have researched them a bit. What, what is the <laughs> difference between these three speakers? What, what is he? Uh, what is his specific focus? Well, I think that the, the interesting thing between the three lectures is uh, they will uh, show us um, the way they do it. People who has placing implants for twenty five, three years. Yeah. I mean, there is not many people in the world with. Uh, there is, of course, there is some, but. Uh, uh, they are among those that with a lot of experience. So they have gone through a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the, the way the, the, the lecture looked like, is that they will show us single, partial, full uh, mouth rehabilitations. And there are three different topics inside the same one. So All right. that's why I think they will cover uh, a broad, a broad field. field. Well, really interesting. It feels like it's ready. Yes. Just a final warning. If you just happen to come across this video anywhere on Facebook and you're wondering what you're looking at, fewer discretion advice because this is educational content for surgeons. So you might see some images which might not comfort you if you're not a professional viewer. So with that final warning, let's go into the room and I hope to see you back in about 90 minutes for the speaker's debrief here in the studio. Are we online now? So after having welcomed you and our speaker, we need to welcome the people that are online. This session is streamed online via Facebook and via the Congress website. And just to tell you what happened in the last two days, we had around 5,000 people following us on the web. So welcome to our web community. And uh, I will start to introduce the topic. Um, it is uh, something very interesting, at least uh, in my point of view. Uh, we all know that if we look at the evidence, we have very high survival rates and success rates of implants in the long term. We also have uh, does not work. We also have a uh, high survival rate of restorations. We also do have good outcomes with reduced treatment time and good outcomes with augmentation of soft and art tissues. This is what the literature tells us. So everything seems to work. If we look carefully at the long-term results, we see that our implants will stay there with an acceptable success and survival rate. But if we look at the prosthesis, you see that in the long term, the data are not the best. But these are more than 10 years follow-up. And also these other studies show similar figures, as you can see. Now. We are talking about hopeless implants. So my first question would be, why do we remove an implant? And when should we remove an implant? And I think that these are two questions that are not nicely addressed by the literature. And one other very important question is, how do we deal with the patient? How do we restore the patient after we have removed the implants? And these are questions that I hope we could answer during this session. Why? There are several reasons to remove an implant. One of the 
I would say, most frequent is perimplantitis. And here we are entering into a dangerous zone, I think you would agree with me. It is difficult to assess the prevalence of perimplantitis. If you look at the figures there, they all change basically because we don't have a true definition of perimplantitis. The diagnostic parameters are different, and this calls for a different prevalence of the disease. We are looking at different things. But one thing is clear when we talk about perimplantitis. And I quote here a systematic, recent systematic review from the editor of clinical oral implant research, Lisa Mayfield. There are cases of perimplantitis like this one, where you can achieve a successful solution of the problem with a regeneration technique. And in the midterm, you have a reasonable outcome. But, and I will read it here, studies shows favorable short-term outcomes, but they also quote, they also show lack of disease resolution, progression and recurrence of the disease and implant loss. So there is a time where some of those implants affected by perimplantitis have to be removed. And there are complex cases like this where we have uh, a combination of perimplantitis and periodontitis, complete lack of a thorough treatment plan, complete lack of oral hygiene. Here we have to reestablish healthy condition, remove everything, and start from scratch again. The other situation that we have to look at is malpositioned implants. And very frequently malpositioned implants appear also in combination with some inflammatory reaction, as you see here. When you have a case like this, and you try to establish a treatment plan, I think that another question comes up. And the question is, why we remove those implants, we know, but when do we remove those implants? And in this case, what we did, we removed the restoration, and you see the clues of you here, but we kept the hopeless implants and the hopeless teeth during the transitional phase to allow the patient to have a fixed provisional restoration and also to make it easier to perform our small GBRs that are needed when we're going to place the implants in this case. So it is much more predictable to perform a GBR procedure and then place a provisional fixed restoration than to have a removable, a complete removable restoration on top of it. So then we wait for healing of the implants and then we complete the extraction. And this is another important point. These patients, they have spent money and efforts to have an extensive restoration and now we have to restore them again. They already demonstrated that they are not the best cleaners. They are still committed to having something better than a denture, but we should probably look for something that is more simple, less expensive and easier to maintain. And so this is how this case ended. And uh, I hope that it is clear what we ask to our speakers today. They will address three different clinical situations, the single tooth restoration, multiple teeth in the aesthetic zone that is the, the most complex situation that we ask to address by our German colleague, and the complete arch situation. So let me call on the podium Miguel, that will introduce our colleagues. Good evening to Heidi Podin. Our speakers in this session don't need presentation. All of us know them well. We are sure that you will enjoy and also learn in this session. The subject of, of this session is how to do 
with hopeless implants. Now and more in the future, all of us will have patients with these problems. And we begin with Maximus Simeon. He is professor and chairman of the Department of Periodontology at the Dental School in the University of Milan. He was past president of the EAO. He is referee of the most important journals in our field. And he is a researcher and international lecturer on topics on periodontology, also integration and more regeneration. He makes easy what is impossible, as you will see later. After, we have another important lecture. He is offered by Carl Lubin Ackerman. He is an active as clinician, as researcher in periodontics and implantology. For the last 40 years, he is part of the history of implantology in Europe. He's part-time lecturer at the Steinbeck University in Berlin, and he is also visiting professor at Dental University of Niigata in Japan. And after Dr. Jean Piergel, it's a pleasure for me to present Dr. Jean Piergel. He introduced dental implants and also integration in Spain. He is director of the Brandenburg Center in Barcelona. He was past president of the EAO, and he is currently associate professor of the oral surgery department in the University of Barcelona. He has a private practice dedicated to bone reconstruction and thigomatic implants. He was my mentor in the field of implantology a long of time ago. Then, we begin with Professor Maximus Simeon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the fantastic introduction. <laughs> it's nice for us, the three of us, to be ready to be put in a museum because we have been part of the EAO and of the history of us integration for such a long time that now probably we are almost ready to to be in a museum like this. <laughs> so uh, I would like to thank also Luca Cordaro for inviting me to this prestigious meeting and uh, for this uh, very intersection. Um, in effect, is something that we don't uh, speak about usually, but I uh, think is today more and more something very, very, very important. So, I think there is... A... Okay. So, I will start giving you just a couple of examples of... Uh, what kind of implants we are supposed to remove. For example, we have cases in which the implants are in the wrong position, and this is uh, probably the most frequent situation. People know how to regenerate the bone, how to treat difficult situations, but most of the time they really don't know how and where to position the implants. And so this kind of situation in which the implant is completely out of the envelope of the bone with the wrong direction, with the wrong angulation, is really very frequent. In these cases, there is nothing to do but to remove the implant. You can see here another situation, very bad aesthetic result. You see that implant is in a completely buckled position and angulation. There is nothing to do if you want to improve the aesthetic result of this patient. Then we have other situations, like for example, infections due to malposition or due to infection like periodontitis. In this case, you see the implant has been placed in contact with the roof of the, of the adjacent tooth. And you see here there was a big infection, and you see here the tooth was completely ground by the apex of the implant. But this is the most uh, fantastic situation. This implant has been placed 
into a root. So the dentist didn't recognize that the tooth, the root of the teeth, the tooth was still in place. And so he placed the implants and there was a major infection. But I want to give you a, a couple of examples of what we can do when we have a situation like this. For example, Daniele, in this case, he was at that time 30 years old and he had this kind of problem in a tooth. You see, major infection. The implant is placed in the right position, but uh, there was a huge problem here. You see, you see here there is some kind of cementum and also a biomaterial that did not integrate it. And this caused a major infection, as you can see here. And just removing the crown, you see the amount of calculus, um, cementum, plaque, and everything. And uh, looking at, after the removal, the convinced CT, you see that that was uh, enough to create a huge defect in this area, and also from a, an occlusal point of view. But this defect is as something that is very important because the bony peaks are maintained. So there is no attachment loss and no bone loss at the geation teeth and this is a single tooth. You will see that Carl uh, Ludwig Ackermann will treat multiple teeth which is more difficult and the chance to be 100% successful are less. In this case, we had uh, the chance to build up the bone from a one peak to the other peak, and this is something that we have learned to do very predictably. I want to show you a short video just to understand the technique that has to be followed very precisely. If we do a mistake in uh, guided bone regeneration, we have a failure. So it's not a very difficult technique, but it's not forgiving. We have to respect all the steps, the flap design, the releasing of the flap, the positioning of the membrane and the bone graft, the, and also the final suture. You can see here that we have a big defect due to the implant failure. In this case, we had to augment the bone vertically from one peak to the other peak. So it's something, again, very predictable if you follow the protocol that we have established in 25 years of experience. You see here the membrane has been cut and adapted to the anatomical situation in such a way that the non-resorbable membrane must not touch the adjacent teeth. Then we fix the membrane in the palatal aspect and we fill the space under the membrane with the bone graft. Usually we use in these cases a mixture of about 70% of autogenous bone chips and about 30 to 40% of the proteinized bovine bone. And we have to augment more than what we need because we can expect all the time a little bit of remodeling after the membrane removal. You see the membrane is fixed very stably with tags also in a buckle position and you can really recognize that it's not touching. There is a half a millimeter of room between the membrane and the geation root because we want to have a nice reattachment of the periodontal tissues. Then after releasing in the preosteum, we start with the horizontal metro sutures. First, to have a kind of a extrusion of the two flaps, a version of the two flaps, and on top of that, we place single uh, stitches with a very thin uh, proline 60 suture. The EPTFE suture is placed also in the oral mucosa, but we place much thinner sutures in the creatinized mucosa, as you can see here. And you can see the healing. The healing, if everything is fine, is eventful. So if we don't make mistake, we don't have membrane exposure. This is very important. We can have still problems with uh, infections, but if the technique is correct, we don't have exposures. And you see here also in the convinced CT that we have reestablished the original anatomy. 
After a period of six to seven months, we reopened the flap, we removed the membrane, and you can see that we have a nice bone. And you see the implant placement? Today, I strictly use hybrid implants. I want to have the rough surface only in the apical 50% of the implant, but I want to have a machine surface in the 50% that is coronal, close to the soft tissues, where bacteria can penetrate and create perimplantitis. And you see here, the thickness of bone in a buccal position is very nice, it's by two, three millimeters. Then to increase the soft tissues, today we have uh, connective tissue graft, but we have also other materials, like this kind of uh, porcine uh, matrix, that is able to increase the thickness of the soft tissues. We have to evaluate in the long term the results of these kind of instruments, but today we have very good results in a few, in the first year or year and a half. Then, after four months of healing, we make the abutment connection, and this is the final result. So we were able to reestablish the anatomy uh, and the healthy and the healthness of the pre-implant tissues. This is not a case that I want to show you because it's a different case. It's a single tooth, there is a bad implant positioning, infection, bone loss, but what is different here is that we have a, a major periodontal attachment loss at the GHN teeth, and this makes everything much more difficult. We have a narrow room, narrow space, that makes everything more difficult because we have a very small flap. We have to be very careful, very delicate in our surgery. And uh, it's a completely different story. So Chiara at that time was 25 years old, very beautiful, and she was treated with two implants in the genesia of the lateral incisor, upper lateral incisors, but very beautiful girl. And the dentist did the first mistake in implant positioning. That, then he tried to uh, treat the situation and did more mistakes. I have a DVD with all the surgery he did because he sent me everything, all the documentation. And the more he was doing surgeries, the worse was the situation going. So you see here, we have a complete loss of, uh, almost complete loss of the periodontium measly of the teeth. So I just removed the implant and I left to heal for six months. We don't want to be in a hurry. When we have a, a patient that had three, four, five surgeries, we have a lot of scar tissues, so the healing is very difficult. So I just removed the implant and left to heal and waited for the situation. And if you look at the situation after, the, after six months, you see that the, the tissue is still a little bit not uh, mature. And if you look at the situation from a lateral point of view, you see how difficult it is. We have uh, no bone, no attachment, and uh, we have a bad soft tissue which is lacking, and so it's gonna be more difficult to cover the bone graft and the possible membrane. Same thing on the contralateral aspect. Also the left lateral incisor is lost, and you can see here the bad implant, bad design, plenty of calculus, cementum, everything, but luckily in this situation there was no attachment loss. And you can see here the situation in the convincity, how is bad. So what is the treatment plan today? What can we do today? One of the treatment planning could be remove the canine because of the attachment loss, the central incisor and the other canine and make a GBR from one peak to the other peak. This is the standard GBR. But in a 25 years old lady, I didn't want to remove those uh, completely healthy teeth and very nice. So I decided to do surgery. And I usually, I don't like to tell the patient and to the mother of the patient, I will try, but I'm not sure. Usually I do only things that I'm sure to be able to perform. In this case, I said, I will try because I don't think it's correct to remove those four teeth. So you see here, after the flap elevation, we have 
huge defect here. And the peaks are there, so there are no bony peaks to regenerate the bone in the middle. So this is something that is uh, out from the protocol, is a different technique. So in this case, I decided to regenerate the bone at, the, uh, at half of the dimension. So I should have regenerated the bone up to here, but was too much. So I just made a, like five to six millimeter vertical regimentation, trying to regenerate the bone. And I wanted to compensate the lack of bone just with soft tissue. And the technique is the same, as you can see here. The membrane positioning, the, the fixation in the palatal aspect, you see how the membrane has been cut very thin because there was no room, and fixation. And immediately I placed a connective tissue graft, as you can see here, to increase from the beginning the amount of connective tissue, the, amount, the thickness of the soft tissues in these cases. And you see here the healing after 15 days was very good. We all the time use fixed restoration, never removable, like Maryland bridges. And this is the contralateral aspect. You see here, same situation, but we have no loss of vertical dimension, and we have uh, very little loss of attachment. So here is mainly horizontal. The technique looks the same, but is 10 times much easier than on the right portion. Here, again, you see the nice healing and uh, the situation after the surgery. So from that uh, terrible situation, with, in, the first, in the second step, we took the patient to this situation, which is not ideal, but is, not, but is at least acceptable. Now, after seven months, we have to remove the membrane. But when you rise the flap in such a situation, you lose vertical dimension. You have some bone resorption, you have some shrinkage of the soft tissue during the healing. So I decided to use a kind of technique that, uh, together with Sasha Jovanovich, we decided to use in a dinner about 20 years ago, in which we decide to make an horizontal cut in the fornix and in the palate, remove the screws and the tacks from the membrane, fixating the membrane, and removing the membrane from inside. This is not very easy. And uh, then from a hole here, I remove the tentin screw, and I place the suture up to here, and with the suture needle, I hooked a piece, a piece of connective tissue, and then I came, out, came back with the suture out from this hole, and then I pulled coronally the connective tissue to increase again the thickness of this area, and also to reposition coronally the free gingival margin at the adjacent teeth to correct the exposure of the root, the root recession. Same thing on the other side, and you see here the healing. So with this step, we went to a situation which is not ideal, but is close to the one that we want to have at the, at the end. Now it's time to, to place an implant. Again, we don't want to rise the flap. I tell you, I hate flapless surgery. I do that only when I have a lot of bone, a lot of soft tissues, and uh, using a computerized guided, co computer guided technique. In this case, I didn't want to do that because I didn't trust the bone that I regenerated. So I wanted to do feeling with my fingers, with my hands, the real bone. I didn't want to lose the feeling of the bone. So I started with the burr, 1.5 millimeter in thickness, and then I'm checking with the probe if all the walls are in the right position. And then I went with a two millimeter burr to 13 millimeter depth. And in that two millimeter diameter preparation, I placed a machine implant with a diameter of 3.3 millimeters. Why a machine implant or an hybrid implant? Because we know that when we augment the bone vertically, we have remodeling. We have some bone resorption. And if we expose the rough surface, 
outside of the bone, we have a very high danger of a perimplantitis. There is a high predisposition of perimplantitis, and the perimplantitis in such a situation is going to be dramatic. So here, with manually, I am inserting the implant with a screwdriver because uh, when you use your finger, you have more sensitivity than using an end piece, an electric end piece. So when you feel that the torque is too much, you go back a little bit, you turn back and forth until you get the implant in the right position with the right torque, without losing uh, the stability. So the ideal torque for this implant is about 35 newton centimeters. When you sit, I check the position of the implant shoulder as compared to the level of the bone. And when I'm happy, I stay with that. Then I'm checking with the, with the hostel machine, the ISQ, to see the stability. In this case, it was 72. So it was pretty good. As, if we consider that the bone that we regenerate is always very soft. And uh, then I placed a very thin and short healing abutment. And I left to heal for additional four months, seven situation on the left portion of the mouth. And you see here, this is the, the provisional restoration. And you can see that uh, still we have some problems. And this is the final, the final situation. If you look at here, we have uh, a little bit of recession at the level of the canine. The lateral incisor is better than the natural teeth because it's easier to regenerate the bone in a vertical direction than to cover the root recessions. And you see here the situation is good. So we have learned that once we got 99% of what we want to get, we don't try to get 1% more because we can make a mistake and destroy most of what we have done. So we will discuss these cases during the following discussion. It's not something that we can do every day, so we have to be very careful. And uh, I'm waiting for a very nice discussion later. With this, I thank you very much. This is the follow-up of the three years. You see the bone, and you can see that uh, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Massimo, for being on time and for the beautiful cases as usual. Uh, before you go back to your seat, Massimo, before you go back to your seat, and while Karl Ludwig is going to prepare his presentation, I would like to ask you uh, a question. Um, I realize the great attention in the second case in removing the membrane without uh, raising a flap. And I see your point that this is the right way to go. Uh, can you explain to the audience uh, what is the biological rationale for such a complicated stuff? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. What we have seen over the years is that when you rise a flap and uh, you expose the regenerated bone, you have a little bit more uh, bone remodeling, and so more bone resorption, and also the soft tissue has the tendency during the healing to shrink. In these cases, in which aesthetic is so important, and which, in which we have regenerated so much bone in a small space, we have to do everything trying to be less, as less invasive as possible, to use the blades and everything in the tip of our fingers, if we can use an Italian way to say. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, so in this case, we really want, I really wanted to you do everything to get the best result for that young, beautiful girl. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So now, Professor Ackerman, he has a very tough job. He will tell us what he's going to do when we have multiple teeth missing in the aesthetic zone and when we have multiple implant failing in the aesthetic zone. Please, Karl Ludwig. Thank you very much for your introduction and thank you for the invitation. Uh, over the years we have learned to talk about the sweet chocolate cases and now it's more common to talk about bitter chocolate cases. And today we talk about 
the real critical cases. So I would like to start my lecture uh, and focusing uh, what I'm talking about, the peri-implantitis, the defect geometry of the cases, the anatomy of the adjacent teeth, which is very important for the positive result, the limitation of present reconstructive therapy, so we have to deal with things that has been done by others, but not by us, the compromises with existing implants that we have to undergo when we do a second stage therapy, the challenge of high lip line means the aesthetic challenge, and of course, augmentation procedures of heart and soft tissue and more or less critical outcomes in a real critical situation. And finally, the limitation of high level final restorations that the patient always accepts. In the beginning, I would like to go with you through a normal anatomical, structural and implant log logical situation. If you watch this uh, canine to canine situation in the upper, and uh, you see the situation of the gingiva, the alveolar crest, the biological width and the papilla, everything is in a proper and natural situation. We are missing one tooth. The bone is stable, we can place the implant, later we can fix a abutment and then a, a single crown on it and everything looks very similar at the implant side and at the tooth side. But now I start the first case and the situation of the patient you can see on the right when she showed up the first at uh, 2014 and the history of the patient was that she has had in 1992 a accident at, on a farm and in 99 she received three implants in the position of 12, 11 and 21 and then she got implantitis and she has had separation at the implant number 12 and 11, then these two implants were then removed and then she received two more implants at this site in 2005 and then the first visit in our clinic it was in 2014. So if, he, if we go through her case with the same drawings, you can see this, this is the perfect outcome with a very critical situation at the adjacent teeth. This is the so-called dental bone. So she first was missing the teeth and in the same time she lost the bone, the alveolar bone. Now we have not only the problem of the heart but also of the missing soft tissue. And you see she received the implants in a vertical wrong position with uh, three crowns on it with a problem that will later on demonstrate uh, the x-rays that she gave to me. And I, he, at that point I would like to uh, show you a publication that was done in 2003 and it was giving us the information that the bone at the dental papilla of implants is independent of the proximal bone level next to the implant. That means that the bone at the adjacent tooth stays even when we have a local limited infection around the implants. And this is one po positive issue that we need to uh, have for our second stage surgical and restorative treatment. Here the patient gave us the history. You can see that in the first place she had a very implants, so now I, no, okay, and you can see that these two implants were uh, very close uh, in sp uh, and no space in between, so she lost these implants and you can see the defect. The defect was augmented and afterwards in 2005 she received uh, a second time two implants at the position of the lateral and of the mid incisor on the right. And this was in 2005 before she received the second restoration. Now, in, uh, nine years later, she came to see me and you can see the high lip line and we will focus on all the things that were negative for a following restoration. And she had pain uh, at the uh, implant at the mid incisor on the left. So the decision was 
to remove this implant. But first of all, I would like to focus what you should look at, the deviation from normality. First, we have the implant axis and the superstructure. This was very poor and it was not what the patient looked for. Then, because of the high lip line, the so-called mucochingeval line is very important. It is distorted at the implant site and this might be a problem for the later outcome of aesthetics. The gingiva margin, you can see that it's not an equal margin at the implant site. Then the fixed gingiva at the teeth and the mucosa is limited or it is reduced. And then we have papillae at the implant site, the dark holes. What we see with the patients, they have no bone among the implant positions and we have an incorrect distance tooth implant here on this side and we have an incorrect distance of implant to implant at this side. Now, after we know what is wrong, we have to think about what can we do to uh, get to a perfect or more positive result. What were the greatest challenges for me? The high lip line, okay, thank you, the high lip line, the aesthetics, the heart tissue that we need to augment, and later on the restorative aesthetics, and of course because of a, a limited open bite, the function. What was explained to the patient? What is a possible result in her case? So it was a multi-stage procedure, limited bone reconstruction, and soft tissue deficiencies even at the end. Then unequal gingiva contours, missing papillae, and compromise to natural dentition. Though I didn't give her any positive information about a so-called restitutio ad integrum. This was a removal of the implant. You can see the situation, the missing bone at the uh, lateral incisor on the left, and first place we did a alveolar um, supporting therapy so that we can keep the structure and the contour of the soft tissues with a bone substitute and a membrane. And this was the situation right after surgery and she received a transitional restoration which was supported by these two implants. This was the first step of her treatment. And then after uh, a while of healing and soft tissue maturation, we did an augmentation at the tooth number 21, and this is the situation, a vertical and horizontal uh, augmentation at the same time to recontour the crest. This is the situation in the x-ray right after surgery. Four months later, removal of the uh, fastening screw for the block and we replaced the missing tooth by an implant again. And then after another four months of healing, you can see the perfect contour and we just opened the case, did some mucogingival corrections in the vestibule and then she received a final, not a final, but a semi-final uh, restoration with a, a three unit uh, ground block and this is how we stabilized it with pink uh, acrylic and with acrylic teeth on a, a framework of non-precious alloy. So finally, the critical ev evaluation is the defect size and the ge geometry predetermining the final result. Bone augmentation does not exceed dental bone level at the adjacent teeth. Uncontrolled implant placement ex exhibits poor reconstructive outcome, missing multiple teeth side by side, standing always end up with a papilla compromised aesthetic. Now, the second case. In the second case, the history, it was an accident in a very young age. And this with eight years of age, then with 15 years, this patient uh, got a, a iliac bone grafting and then afterwards three dental implants and the first visit 
was about 11 years later, and this is her outcome. So if you look at the patient situation, she had not a high lip line, and, and she has had a very critical love line, and a very poor bone situation around the implants, and a discoloration of the implants. So when we look at the case, number one, this is a normal situation at the adjacent teeth, the canines, the lateral incisor, and this is the missing length of the crowns because the, uh, uh, the patient grow over time, but the implant side was not growing with all the rest of the bone. And all together we have a defect area like this, so we are missing the papillas, we are missing the uh, gingiva or the mucosa, and we're missing a lot of bone down to the implant shoulder. And the, what were the greatest challenges in this case? Vertical bone loss, soft tissue deficiency, scarry tissue, inadequate crown length, speech function, the average and normal lip line was more or less a positive situation, and the horizontal continuous alveolar defect. What was explained to the patient as a possible result? No promises according to another implant re re restoration. Of course, it sh must be a multi-stage advanced surgical procedure, several transitional restorations, and long-lasting cost-intensive treatment measures. So this is the situation prior to the surgery when we removed the implants and the lateral incisor on the right, and we can you can see the situation uh, that we have that we miss a lot of bone, vertical and horizontal. She has had a transitional restoration with a uh, adhesive bridge. After several months, here you can see the defect size, but at the adjacent teeth, almost uncritical soft tissue supported by the dental bone, and this was her transitional restoration and the aesthetics at those days. Then we decided to use bone blocks, J-crafts from the hip, and you can see this was the amount of bone that should be augmented, and from a three-dimensional point of view, we had a good situation at the labial bo uh, residual bone, but a very uh, compromised vertical bone situation. So with this kind of overextension of the bone, we, you can see the situation in the cephalogram. We could e even stabilize the lip and the soft tissues. And now, the, uh, because of our experience, four months after, Ilya craft, crafting, we placed the implants. You can see the amount of bone and the implants in a proper calculated position. And here we have the abutments and the first transitional restoration on the right side. And here you can see in 2013, the first step of new restoration. You can see that she now raises the lip higher than before, and you can see the perfect lip support and the, uh, the uh, room that is necessary for speech function. And three and a half years later, this was then the stability of the tissues that we could see. We took an impression and fabricated a setup and wax up, and from this setup and wax up, the technicians then manufactured the final restoration. You can see now her uh, final situation with pink porcelain and the teeth as a, a block of four units. Here you can see it, and you can see the amount of mimicking the soft tissue. This is the bone level. This, of course, needs to be a, a perfect for oral hygiene, and this is the patient right after the final treatment, and you can see that she is laughing now and is exposing the artificial papillas of pink ceramic. This is the stability in the bone level. 
The critical evaluation in this case is bone augmentation and placement of dental implants should be executed mainly in adults, older, not younger, older than 20 years, limited quality and quantity of soft tissue, enhance the risk of dehiscences and aesthetic outcomes, sorry, compromised clinical outcomes after severe trauma always need to be treated in numerous stages to control healing processes and stabilization of the various tissues. No time pressure in a case like this during the whole situation. And to summarize my lecture, main concepts presented were based on bone augmentation and implant placement should not be executed in children or young adults uh, younger than 20. This is a, a, a systematic review our colleague Professor de Heiden published last year. The limitations of horizontal and or vertical bone augmentation is the dental bone at the adjacent teeth. This is clinical experience which you heard from Massimo also. And then the biological width, the biological width characterizes the relation between heart and soft tissue independent of the existing bone level. And finally, ilia crest bone is a stable augmentation to house dental implants long term, according to the protocol I gave to you with the four months after bone augmentation, we place the implants and another four months later, we load the implants first time. So all this is clinical experience. This is a prospective study and the systematic review in the first place. So finally, I would like to thank again Luca and of course the EAO uh, board members that they gave me the chance to present here in Madrid in front of you such a, a bitter chocolate, but uh, I hope that I gave you some ideas that uh, you might take home as a good message. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your interesting and nice presentation. And could I have your question? Why do you use one implant per tooth? In this particular case, both patients were very young and they had a very severe sit situation and outcome. And I tried to stabilize the bone, the augmented bone, by placing an implant so that alternative function will stabilize the bone long term. And on the other side, it was more or less a safe situation then because we could morph or better fabricate the superstructure with the uh, pink ceramic gingiva. And of course, if in a very bad situation, this patient would lose one implant out of the three, we then could continue with the same restoration again. Thank you very much. And the last speaker is my dear Dr. Joan Ping. He will speak to us when we have all the implants hopeless and all the teeth hopeless. We have no teeth, no implants, and usually no bone. And he can show us what he does. I I'm sure we enjoyed the last presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, for the uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank also the organizing committee. And, and uh, I just say to Alberto, congratulations for this excellent meeting. And thank you for allowing me to come and share with you some of my clinical experience. I agree with the comment that Massimo said that uh, if we are prone to go to the museum, but <laughs> let's take a, a positive. If we put together the three of us, we have more than a hundred years of experience. It's not bad, is it? Okay. Let's uh, talk about hopeless implant. And to talk about hopeless implant is to talk about failure. And it's not the nicest thing to talk about because it's a failure for us as a healthcare provider, and the most important, it's a failure for the patient, and the patient is the one that suffers. 
I must say that in my uh, presentation, I have no any kind of clinical, I am sorry, uh, conflict of interest for any company, any group. And it's all based on my own uh, clinical experience with some literature uh, background, of course. One of the reasons for leaving a, an implant to be hopeless is a malposition. If you see this case, for instance, is a it malposition because they are in a very apical position and very buccal direction. This kind is unrestorable. We cannot restore this kind of patient. What, uh, what is the treatment for the patient? You see, buccal direction, very apical, unrestorable. What do we do in those uh, type of cases? Remove the implant, explantation. What does it mean? It means a big and huge defect. After this uh, defect, what we should do? Reconstructing. Reconstructive surgery using hip uh, graft, a saddle hip graft, to rebuild horizontally as well as apically, to make this uh, emergency profile much better than it used to be and reconstruct the old profile and having this uh, level emergency profile with very nice keratinized tissue. And this uh, very fast uh, treatment that I expose right in, in seconds, for the patient it took more than a year of treatment. More than a year of treatment, more than five surgeries, and a lot of sufferance. Sufferance uh, emotionally, physically, and as well as economically. That means what should we always look for some positive. The positive thing is that after 25 years, he still is enjoying the oral rehabilitation. That's the positive. But in the meantime, she suffers a lot. Let's see the champion of the malposition. What we do with this? Do you have any idea? Of course we have an idea just to explant and go for another kind of treatment that we are going to expose later on. But should we worry about this for the future? Should we worry about repeating this kind of, uh, of uh, situation? We should not. Why we should not worry about this? Because we now are on the digital era. And in a virtual environment, we can decide the exact position of the implant. We should not put the implant like, like uh, with a weapon. You know, we decide, and then with the use of 3D printers, we can perform guide surgery, which allows us to place the implants on the, pla on the place that we want, relating to the prosthesis. From a piece of plastic, we can have a different kind of... Uh, of uh, guides, even from a dentate. This is a first guide for the uh, establishing pins. This is a guide for the osteotomy. This is the guide for placing the implants. You see, stabilizing pins, osteotomy, placing the implants. And the implants will be placed according to the new prosthesis. And that's what we are looking for. At the, today, this is possible. We don't need to go back and place the implants in this, uh, let's say, stupid position. But in spite of having the implants very well positioned, the, yeah, sorry, the, in, the patient can develop what we know as peri-implantitis, which today is the main reason for leavening uh, implant to be hopeless. This is the uh, situation where the patient has lost all the supporting bone, and just uh, the, the implants are just uh, with, with the apical part still integrated, still in place, and even though still functioning. But is that a, a, a situation that we can look forward? Not at all. In the literature, we have seen in a, in a very uh, well reputed journal called that it, it's a marginal problem or it's a tsunami. What do you think today? Maybe it's not a tsunami, but as you know, it's a topic that it's, it's always in all major uh, implant meetings. In all the meetings, we are this topic of perimplantitis. If you look on the literature in the systematic review, even is no unanimous consensus on the definition. Imagine what happens with the prevalence. Dr. Luca Cordaro has uh, informed us that is no consensus. The prevalence can range from 10% 
even to 53%. The theology, there is no consensus on the theology, from bacterial to even host response, the disbalanced host response. And what about the treatment? Many different treatments, but there is no evidence on each one, or there is someone which is uh, better than others. If we look on the, uh, on the main topic of this Congress, 25 years of implant dentistry, what have we learned? What have we learned during those uh, 25 years? I'm going to tell you what I have learned during those uh, 25 years. I learned that if I start placing implants in 1985 with a machine surface, until 2000, 2002, that we start using RAF, the prevalence of perimplantitis in my office goes rise up almost 40%. Suddenly I realized that something happens with this kind of surface and then I change and now it's dropping, dropping down. This is what I learned. And this is what Massimo also was pointing out about using different types of uh, surfaces. This is the situation. You know, some definition of perimplantitis said lack of supporting bone, bleeding, pus. This is what, what is perimplantitis. What we do with this kind of thing? There is any... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, because I, I can't fall down in, on the questions. Yeah. What can we do in this kind of, of situation? There is any treatment that we can, we can just recover these implants? Not at all. There is no treatment that can make a reconstruction with the implants in place. What is the treatment available today? Removable. Explantation, as we did with the, with the first case. Explantation. Leaving the patient with a very, very difficult situation. Much worse than it was at the beginning before the treatment. And do we have something available for this kind of patient which we have both in it with our treatment? We could provide the patient with something that he could enjoy uh, the quality of life. Yes, we do. We do have possibilities of treatment. From the first uh, situation or the first treatment possible is autologous bone reconstruction, very well documented by Professor Bronemark. And following his strict protocol, we could have very predictable results. We have been using this protocol for many times. I've been published this in 2002, the 10 years follow up with a very high uh, survival rates of the implants as well as the graft. Another possibility is the use of Segoma implants. We were introduced by Professor Bronemark also in uh, early 1987, uh, sorry, 1997, and we uh, participate in a study with the with 16 clinics that we start with the system and uh, with a very, very high results. This is one example, even with immediate loading, that we place a couple of uh, of uh, implants in the zygoma, some regular fixation in the premaxilla, regenerating the premaxilla in order to give the, the patient with a better uh, lip support and an immediate prosthesis that splint to avoid lateral movements, but then in the later on the final prosthesis, this is going to be out of it. That means this is another alternative, perhaps less invasive than the other one. The other one has a lot of morbidity on the head. This is less invasive. Let's look for the third uh, possibility, which is even less invasive. Bone reconstruction by means of GBR, guided bone regeneration. We have the, the master of the guide bone regeneration here with us, Professor Simeon, who has published as early as 94 for the vertical ridge augmentation with, using, with the use of membranes and different kind of materials. And this is the treatment that I'm going to propose. You see cases like this, that after an implant treatment, there is a massive uh, horizontal and vertical uh, bone loss. Some other cases are huge defects due to infection of the implants that must be removed. And of course, the patient has lost a lot of uh, bone. This is a case. This is the first case that I'm going to present. We have after a healing period, he has lost uh, vertical as well as horizontal. Here is, you see the diagnosis uh, place where the, in, the teeth should be. And this is what we, we missed. A very atrophic situation that normally years ago we treated with uh, 
with the uh, hip bone graft. A membrane, we uh, shape the membrane in order to get a convex situation. Some holes to have some cells, some osseo conduct, uh, osseo, sorry, osseostogenic cells just to invade the spaces. And biomaterial. Biomaterial without any autologous bone, just biomaterial and allowing the, the cells coming up through this uh, biomaterial. And if you look in this situation, it's very similar with the uh, hip crest. There are some cells, there are some anorganic framework, and there is a cortical, which we can say that it's similar the, of uh, a membrane. It's a very similar situation. Biomaterial, some cells, the membrane. We close, that's very important, as Professor Simeon says, if there is an exposure, there is no uh, possibility of the treatment. And after nine months, minimum nine months of healing, we have this vertical augmentation as well as horizontal augmentation. After nine months, this is the situation with the membranes and before and after. You see there is almost no bone on the crest. There is now a very a nice bone to place the implants. And what is this about? What is what we, they have been published a lot about what is in, in this newly created bone. It's newly formed bone, very mature. This is a stepanol tension that as pink as the, the color as mature is the bone. That means that it's very mature bone in very close contact with the particles. And with the circular polarized light, we see the collagen fibers parallel to the osteon. That means this bone is highly resistant to compression. With this, we can place the implants. We measure the ISQ as high as 77. Now, prostodontists can decide if we go, if it goes ahead with the prosthesis of the late prosthesis. It doesn't matter. This is the prosthesis. And five years later, I've been some bone remodeling in this area, but the rest is maintaining the bone around these implants. Let's look at another case. In this case, we have a combination, uh, local defects uh, due to uh, very uh, severe periodontitis on those implants, that the other were already left, and also very uh, small uh, 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 basal bone on the premaxilla. This situation, very large sinus on the premaxilla, we have lost almost all bone. Same protocol, membrane, biomaterial, implants in place with some sinus graft, and the final uh, work. This, it takes a long time, I agree, but there is no donor site, and the bone is highly uh, vascularized, and it's a very mature and, and bone. This is the uh, x-ray after a year. And what about this situation? Very huge defect to due to uh, implant infection. We place an EPTFA membrane in one side and collagen, uh, cross-link collagen membrane in the contralateral side. We see what, what the results are. We have a very uh, late uh, exposure that means nothing for the, uh, for the uh, regeneration. If it's an early exposure, everything is missed. I mean, we lose everything, but it's a late exposure, nothing happens if we remove the membrane as, as soon as possible. As you can see, it has no uh, damage the uh, amount of uh, regeneration. And again, and this afternoon, we're talking with Massimo, with Thomas Albrechtson, and we were talking about this. We didn't know the presentation each other, but we know that we are using this type of implants. Why? Because if it's some exposure, we have machine, and we have the sparing with the machine implants. And we don't like to have rough surfaces exposed to bacterial, uh, from bacteria from the mouth. 70 ISQ, the same. We can go with the, uh, with the, uh, with the temporary or with the uh, immediate load or the late load. With the collagen membrane, we didn't have the same result as with the, uh, with the re titanium reinforced membrane. That's it's in my hands, in my experience. Doesn't mean that this is the normal thing. And you see situations like this, we go from this situation, very, very, really atrophic to a situation with uh, a very a maxilla with a very predictable, uh, I mean, very mature bone to predictably uh, insert the implants. 
how much volume do we gain with this, uh, with this uh, technique? How much volume do we gain? With the Osiris uh, software, we can evaluate the volumetric augmentation. We have been done this uh, work with the group of the uh, University of Barcelona. And with the, you know that the Osiris takes some reference points and then looking the uh, CT scan before and after treatment. This is that we have done with the 10 first consecutive uh, uh, patients. A total of 64 implants were placed. No one failed to integrate and no one failed until now. The, the time of waiting period is uh, range from three to five years. And what do we get? Almost 70% of bone volume augmentation. That means we, we go from, from a situation of traffic, we gain 60, 67, almost 70% of bone volume gain uh, with this technique. In summary, what is the, uh, the concept that I present some are systematic reviews that perimplantitis as a main reason for hopelessism has no unanimous definition, no unanimous uh, uh, etiology, and of course, not with a treatment. Vertical bone augmentation is a reliable technique with guide bone regeneration in large osseous defects. In, this is based on prospective and retrospective studies. And finally, bone reconstruction by means of GBR is a predictable technique in the severely atrophic maxilla. And this, as I know, as I said before when starting the, with the lecture, this is my own experience. This is what I experience in my office. I think we are on time. I am pleased that I, I finish a couple of minutes and I take the opportunity to thank the organizing committee. Thanks, Luca, for inviting me and it's a pleasure and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Okay. So, jean P, please come here. Now, to me, it comes the interesting part. We have seen the magic, as you would agree with me. Thank you. And now we have the need for some discussion. And as you know, this is a, 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 an online streamed session. So we have questions from you guys and we have questions coming from the web. And uh, it is interesting because most of the questions that we have received are the same. Uh, let's start with the last speaker. So we are fresh. Now we received the, uh, around <laughs> around five questions that are concerning how do you deal with a temporary restoration in these extensive uh -huh. GBR cases? Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, you can imagine, it's a totally edentulous and temporarily the patient just can have a, a, temp uh, a removable prosthesis. When do we place the, uh, when do we allow the patient to, to wear the, uh, the removable prosthesis after a couple of weeks? When the soft tissue is completely healed, then we allow the patient to wear the, the his denture, of course, realigned, uh, readapted to a new situation because the maxilla, we have changed completely the shape, but the patient can put, of course, we ask, to, to be careful, we ask for don't chew uh, hard uh, materials, but patient can, can have the, the normal life with the, the denture. Thank you. And another question that I think is for both of you, Massimo and Jean P, is uh, why are you using hybrid implants? What is the advantage? You have <laughs> both mentioned it, but you know, it is a little bit, uh, um, I would say, uh, complicated because uh, all the companies that are providing us with the material have gone in the last 20 years towards rough surfaces, then uh, micro rough surfaces, and now it looks like you are afraid of this kind of situation and uh, uh, you expect machine surfaces to behave in a better way. And is there any data for this? How much time do I have to answer? <laughs> <coughs> Be good. <laughs> okay. So you want no, to go first? No, 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 no. You first. So uh, we, together, it's very nice to be here. We know each other since uh, probably 25 or more even years. More, even more. Yeah. And uh, we were speaking with Thomas, uh, like uh, Kwana said, because, uh, you know, when you look at your uh, career and your experience in implants that is lasting for such a long time, we can put together all the concepts and all the experience that we had 
And we were lucky enough to start very early with the Bronemark system, with the machine implants, and we have been using that system for pro- almost uh, more than 15 or maybe 20 years uh, until the two year 2000, 2002. And at that time, preimplantitis was almost absent from our experience. Mm-hmm. There were preimplantitis with, uh, with uh, you know, TPS implants, with the hydroxylapatite implants, but not with the machine implants. So, or very, very seldom. You could see once a year one implant. In fact, they asked me to do research on preimplantitis in that time. I said, I cannot because I don't have any case. So I, it, it takes 10 years to, to collect the, enough patients. Then uh, when there was kind of a race between all the companies to go to the rough surface. And every company was producing his own surface. We had a complete, complete change of the situation. In the beginning, I think all of us, we were enthusiasts to do that because we were, you know, confident to increase the amount of, uh, of uh, integration, losing less implants. And for the first uh, Five years, so we continue to be enthusiastic about that. But then we started to see perimplantitis. And in the beginning, we didn't believe that because we were not used to see them. But now, then after a few years, we started to see, you know, progressive bone loss, progressive bone loss. And we have never seen that before. And the amount of progressive bone loss in our patient was increasing exponentially for 10 years. And then after not 10 years, but before we started to say, okay, now there is time to say that. And it's time to stop and change. Okay. And uh, there were some surfaces that were better, some surfaces that were worse. Yes, so this is my question. Couldn't this be, couldn't this thing that you have seen be related to a certain surface, not to all rough surfaces? I, I don't know if you have had experience with several I don't know systems. If you want to <laughs> Thank you, Marcio. <laughs> that was very, nice, very kind of you. Uh, to yeah, let, to uh, let yeah, me talk about the specific surface. No, 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 no. no. We, we, we are, okay, we are no. not talking about okay. Uh, uh, okay. companies or okay. things. Then I, 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 my ahead. question is, yes. you know, there are several uh, people that are using since decades rough surface implants, and they are pretty happy with it. Now, you said that you have changed uh, your attitudes, mm. and I was using at the beginning uh, machined implants as well. Uh, and then you realize that uh, by changing from machine to uh, to rough, something happened. Yeah, uh, couldn't it this happened to to going thing. back from yeah. rough to machine yeah. or to hybrid? The uh, yeah. the thing is that we start using well, first of all, for because the 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 pressure of the company and and the media and the meetings and all this, and we change from uh, from machine to rough because it was if that was in the literature. That, uh, in the, above all, in the upper jaw, we have much more, uh, fatal rate with the machine implants. And it's true that at the beginning, when I start with the, with the rough surface, what happens is that we had much better result, immediate results. It improved. It, it improved. It really yeah. improved. But w- what we didn't know at that time is after five, six, seven years, start developing, a, a lot of patients start developing what we know as perimplantitis. Because at the beginning with the machine implants, mm-hmm. we call uh, marginal bone loss. Okay. We didn't call perimplantitis because what we were experiencing is so few numbers of, of uh, bone loss. And that's why probably Massimo and I arrived to the same uh, thinking without Communi- contacting, communicating. Contacting <laughs> each other. We haven't seen many times, but no. uh, no, never talk about this topic. Okay. This is, this is a very interesting topic. And... Uh, uh, let me ask a personal question to all of the speakers here and also to Miguel. Now, we have seen that we realize sometimes that an implant has a problem that is failing. Now, I think that here we all agree that if it is uh, uh, an, an implant in an aesthetic zone, probably the best thing to do is to remove it immediately because uh, it would be difficult to have an uh, efficient treatment of perimplantitis that delivers us a a reasonable aesthetic result. But when it comes to a a tooth that is in a posterior zone, uh, we know that treatment of perimplantitis is not 100% successful, but still there is a chance, both with resective and regenerative Mm. uh, techniques, to uh, at least elongate 
the implant time. Uh, what is the threshold for you guys when you decide whether you keep this implant or you explant it immediately? You want to comment? Ludwig, please. Okay, I started to place implants in the end of the uh, 70s, and I started with sandblasted implants. They were rough surface, but we did, and but we had a polished color. Mm -hmm. And this was because we were thinking of the bone loss that you described already, that we de uh, were uh, experiencing over time, so that we said, when the implant will be exposed, to sh we, we have a polished color. Then we came to the solution that we need stability, and of course, you know, all the situation, we need primary stability very high to make an immediate loading, for example. So then we lost... Uh, our ideas about the biological and physiological thinning, what might happen at the crest. We do not have a crest always flat. That means that we always have a different uh, uh, bone, level. Level. Yeah, level. bone level at the implant site. So uh, what we could see over the years is that the bone level stays stable at the borderline between rough and smooth. With your implant, you have half of the implant, about half of the implant with a rough surface and the other rest of the threads is machined. Also with your implants, yeah? Yes. Ah, what well, his implant, okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to me, uh, I have the question, if you have half of the implant machined, why do you do the apical half in a rough uh, modality? Do you think that is for better for primary stability and the rest is better for bone healing at the crest? Uh, no, I always think that they are, the question was, when do you remove? Yes. So I remove yeah. an implant when I have all around the implant bone loss. When I can't do anything, for example, a regenerative therapy, you only can do when you have, let me say, a lingual bone level up to the implant shoulder. But uh, I have seen many uh, mechanical and um, laser and photodynamic cases that I've done that they were coming back with infection. Mm -hmm. And then I had to remove the implant on a worst situation than it was in the beginning. So to me, today, I always have a lot of talk with the patient to convince the patient to remove the implant earliest time possible. Okay, so we heard someone saying, first time I clean, second time I remove. remove. <laughs> and I see that here the, the, I, the speakers are a little bit on that line. Eh? No, not, not exactly, because uh, I think the problem is that there is no evidence that the, where are the limits, you know, when an implant can be uh, restore, I mean, uh, regenerate maintain. the bone or maintain and when to be extract, extract. But what I think is, of course, it depends on the type of defect. Is it some walls remain? I mean, there is some, some, uh, kind of variables that, that can differ. But for me, in my, in my experience, when it's more than two thirds of the implant, I mean, it should be, it should be, uh, extracted. Okay. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah. You want? No, I think we go again to mm -hmm. Professor Ackerman. There is, there are few questions coming from the web, and they are asking about prosthetic compensation. Now, I am well aware that the two cases that you showed are very, very difficult and challenging cases. Uh, on the other hand, at the end, we had some kind of prosthetic trick to uh, solve the case because it was impossible to restore the amount of hard and soft tissue that was needed to have normal emergence profile. The question is, when you have a case like this, what is the need to augment if you then end up with a prosthetic compensation? Is that because you want to have a smaller uh, cantilever or a smaller portion of pink porcelain or pink acrylic? I can tell you for the second case that I asked the patient to undergo a, a final surgery and do a dental alveolar osseo distraction. 
and verticalize the uh, bone and then have a residual height of the crown and don't need the uh, pink porcelain. But she refused. So she, for her, this was a solution that she could go with. And as we said before, when we started doing implants, we had no experience. When we deal with cases like this, we have not so much experience. And they, both of the ladies were very young, end of the 20s, and they have a long way to go. So I tried to do the best I could by the number of the implants and by the uh, blocking the crowns, uh, because with this, you can do the pink ceramic. Okay. I think that here all the audience, and I hope also the people on the web, we all realize that these are very challenging cases. We have heard three master clinicians with years, I would say decades of experience, that uh, have showed us great results when it comes to the single tooth, uh, more complicated results when it comes to multiple teeth, but this is the case also when we have to restore at the beginning multiple teeth missing in the aesthetic zone, known when we have to re-restore them. And uh, we have also seen a very technique-sensitive way to approach the completely atrophic maxilla as a, a consequence of implant loss. I think that here the message is that this is very, very difficult stuff. Cannot be performed by everybody. And uh, to make a mistake when retreating such a case, will end up in a disaster. I don't know if you will all agree on this. There is yeah. no black and white. Yes. There's always something in between. Yeah. I, I would agree that at the end, these cases will end up anyhow in some kind of compromise. So probably as clinicians, our most difficult thing is to choose together with the patient what kind of compromise we want to end up with. Of course, well, if you are Massimo Simeon, then sometimes <laughs> it might be that... No, you you don't easy. end with much a compromise, easy. but uh, but for all the others, I think that uh, treating okay. these cases is is very very challenging. So we are in time. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, the speakers, and you guys uh, for being here on Saturday afternoon so late to listen to these three master clinicians. And thank you very much, Miguel, for helping me in this. And uh, thank you all. Welcome everybody back here in the studio. Stay tuned because this broadcast ain't over. What's going to happen in the next 20, 25 minutes is that while the session in the room is being ended, we are pulling our speakers from stage, running them over here to the backstage studio, where we'll try to even deeper and further get the real practical takeaways from this session. So uh, we already see quite some questions coming in from you in the comments on Facebook. If you just joined us, that's the way it works. You can, we're live, so you can type in your questions and we will try to answer them either by our speakers or by our two experts here with me in the studio. And I'm, I'm very proud and honored to be joined by Oscar Gonzalez from uh, Madrid here in Spain and Frank Schwarz from uh, Dusseldorf in Germany. Gentlemen, for uh, we see quite a lot of uh, people are watching, a lot of people also tuning in later. So. If we try to summarize what we've just heard on stage, how, how would you grasp the message of this session? Okay, I think we have just saw uh, an excellent uh, review of three great clinicians and also two great moderators with a lot of experience and giving us uh, ideas about how to approach the type, this type of case. I will first, uh, I would like to highlight the, the, the fact that they have been very honest. They have shown difficult cases to us, cases that uh, any of us will, will be wow, crazy about it when they show up in your office. So, so they are very difficult uh, situations to be, to be solved. And not only that, um, uh, the, the way the session has been structured, it was presented in three different scenarios, single, partial, and full rehabilitations. And three of the situations that they are completely different, even the way we approach them, even the way that, that we can deliver the message to the patients to say, listen, we can solve that, or to be honest, we cannot. Yeah. And um, still, I want to, to, I'm looking forward to them to be here because uh, we have still some questions. It still uh, has been very amazed for us, the, um, you know, the, 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 the move to the machine implant 
and uh, that we were to ask these two guys with uh, so much experience, two big clinicians, well, uh, the company goes to th- through this way and, uh, and what's going on that uh, we're moving to something different. And uh, so still a lot of questions and we're looking forward oh. to have them here. Well, uh, they're, they're hopefully on their way. And uh, in the meantime, let me do a quick sh- shout out to all the active commenters. I mean, we just see Abdelkana Banani, regards from uh, Morocco. We see uh, uh, Cassius Farina from Brazil. Good morning to you guys. And I guess good evening to all our uh, uh, friends in the Far East. Glad you're still with us. Stay tuned because the speakers are soon coming. Frank, if you look back at this session, what is your first reflection? So the first reflection is quite clear. So implant dentistry is not forgiving. It means when you run into trouble, it, um, it, it even becomes more difficult. So this is the basic message that we should keep in mind. So to, to start from the very early beginning at a stage where we can overcome problems. So exactly. So. And, and I guess it's all about, we, we just heard it in the final discussion about the threshold, both of, of taking a problematic implant out or in, but I, I guess yeah. also the threshold of when to keep things in your own practice and when to refer to a more advanced professional. Right? Yeah. Well, any, any, any indicators to, to determine whether or not you should try to fix things yourself? Well, that's a very complex question to, uh, to answer. Uh, no, I think each one should know... Uh, as, as I said at the beginning, I think diagnosis is, is key. So I think you have to analyze the case and then uh, to, to make sure that the, the factors that are involved in the case, uh, uh, we are able to solve them. And uh, if so, if you have the skills or even if you want to go into this type of treatment or, or you prefer not to. And uh, that's something that uh, each professional knows. Uh, is, is a personal uh, determination. Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, this is really speedy. Let's move over. Yes, if you guys good. move to this For side sure. of the table, we're going to welcome our three speakers here live in the studio. Gentlemen, congratulations on, uh, on this Very wonderful nice. session. We've uh, really enjoyed it here live from the studio. And I think our online audience is quite happy with it as well. And they've been uh, uh, sending in questions. But before I'll take to them, I'll let my uh, experts take the honor of uh, taking the first questions to you. Well, so Oscar, start. Okay. So, um, as, uh, as he say, we have been discussing, and uh, we first of all, congratulations. It has been amazing, not only for the clear message, but also for the honesty. To be in front of, of all these fellows and show these difficult cases, not everyone is, is allowed to do that. And uh, So thank you very much. But... Um, uh, still, when we, we have seen the question from the people and uh, discussing with Frank before, what is a hopeless implant? What is? Yeah, w- yes. the, the session title is dealing yeah. with hopeless implants. <laughs> <laughs> when is a, an implant yeah. hopeless? I know you were talking about malposition implants, I was t- talking about infection. There's something else, or basically this is the two big uh, factors that you will consider not like like an imp- hopeless impact. Is it? Nobody asked us about the title of the session. <laughs> Give a lecture. Yeah. This topic. Yeah. Uh, no excuses. It's a good, it's a good no excuses. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a good question. Uh, an implant that you can't keep in the patient's mouth because of the real critical outcome of the soft and hard tissue. This is a hopeless implant. That's what we call when the, when the decision is made to take it out and, and, and start doing something new. Yeah. Also, <clears throat> I think that a hopeless implant is an implant that in your treatment planning, you will do a better job if you remove it instead of trying to save it. Okay. That's so a beautiful answer. That's, that's the real thing. If you decide that you will do a better job, you just take it off. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, going back to the the greenfield situation, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the, uh, if we, if we looking for a, for a definition, maybe a uh, uh, hopeless implant is that one that can accomplish a restorative treatment, can accomplish a health for the patient, and can accomplish the aesthetic outcome that the patient normally looks for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then. It's a, it's a hopeless implant. And we have to start over. We start yeah. over. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So maybe we can just uh, well, <laughs> stick with... Um, uh-huh. with I stay with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In your presentation, you have yeah. briefly commented on a lack of consensus regarding 
the disease definition, which is not really reflecting what I'm aware of. So we have a quite good consensus on the disease definition. Mm -hmm. We have a lack of consensus on a case definition, but we have a proper consensus on the etiology. So I wouldn't question the etiology in the absence of data pointing to a different etiological. So factor rather than plaque. So this is was a little bit um, no. That, what I the, the, the comment is that there is I think on it's not my thinking. It's in, on the literature. There is uh, there have been a lot of workshops with some kind of definitions regarding the clinical aspects. But the case but, definitions. Uh, the case definitions. But as you know, very recently. We have heard and we have read about this balanced foreign body reaction, which is not the same as an inflammatory and infective disease. Yeah. That's why I pointed out it's not uh, a consensus because our two etiologies completely, completely yeah. different. And and the the when it talks to when it goes to the definition. This is what, uh, with uh, a research that has been done in, and has been published in two, uh, 2016, that it's now the conclusion was not really a consensus in the definition there. Yeah, that, that, so that's you, because the literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm, I have a, a perfect idea what is perimplantitis, I, I can know, tell you. <laughs> I know, I know. But this is not a topic here, yeah. but just uh -huh. to being yeah. precise, since yeah. many people are a little bit confused coming from the web response. So we have an in preparation of the upcoming EFP AAP World Workshop. Um, there is a clear yeah. consensus on the etiology and all the other things are hypothesis that needs yeah. to be proven, but not by the community that has provided the proof that plug is the etiological and, factor. I think, I personally think that there is a need for, for clarification of it because it's a problem that we are facing more and more and more. And we need to, to be, uh, to have uh, a back, uh, I mean, a clarifying definition, a theology, because we need to treat patients. Yeah. yeah. That's true. But this is well defined. So. Okay. Shall, shall we go to a question of our uh, online audience? Because our online audience is really dying to bring this into the practice next Monday, right? So what are we going, uh, going to do different? Um, I, I take a, a first question from Sarah Renfield, who is uh, referring to the team of predictability, which is the key metric here, uh, of course, when we're doing this. And she's asking, how predictable are implants which have been placed in a location where a, a previous implant has failed? Excellent. Other question. How predictable is an implant in a place where a tooth failed? Yeah, okay. So, so is it, so so if, you're if you have, that, if you do no not have the history of a failing tooth, most of the time it's periodontitis, then you do not have the, you can be sure that an implant will be 100% successful in this mouth cavity. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see in an everyday situation. Uh, primarily, we were happy because we did not know nothing. We were placing implants. Now we have to deal with the consequences. And uh, when you go through the situation in our country, we have the mouse study all over Germany, and it says the most teeth are lost because of periodontitis or per chronic periodontitis. Mm -hmm. So then we have to uh, think about why should an implant not get the same disease? Yeah. We have not the answer yet. We, we don't have the answer yet, and basically, you but we have to deal no specific difference yeah. whether the implant was failing or the tooth was failing. Are you are you agreeing as well? Yeah, yeah, I I totally agree with Carl, but I would like to give an answer to the colleague. It depends on the reason why that implant failed, because if you remove an implant that failed because of a malposition and you place a new implant in a good position, you have a lot of solve, chances. Solve the source, yeah. If you uh, remove an implant due to the infection and you remove the implant and solve the infection and place a new one, you have good chances to have a, you know, a successful implant. Exactly. If you place an implant in the same wrong position and you don't treat the infection, yeah, you don't have any chance. Yeah, so again, back to your uh, point about it's all about the diagnosis uh, being right. Yes. One comment on removing implants. Patients, they don't want us to remove implants. Even if an implant is only one-tenth of a millimeter in the bone, it's, for the patient, it's stable. 
exactly. the only pressure the patient has is pain. Mm -hmm. Only when they have pain, they are ready to, that you, you can take the implant out. On the other hand, we have to deal with the patient and give them information why and uh, an implant that is a failing implant should be removed on the earliest time possible. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's aligned with what we talked about before the session, that it's such a complex matter of biological, functional, aesthetic, but also these interpersonal dimensions uh, in the field. If, if you allow me, I'll, I'll take another question uh, uh, from Jamil Awad Shibli. It's kind of a long question, so bear with me. We do not have any evidence that roughness surface is more susceptible than smooth surface to peri-implant diseases, except HA and TPS surfaces. Could the speakers please clarify this issue? There is a difference between marginal bone loss and biological width. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading out the question, but thanks for your question. <laughs> So the, the, the matter of the different surfaces and its influence. I gave the answer. Uh, I can see in my cases in implants where we have a small or a wider uh, polished color. If you place the polished color underneath the bone level, you will have a greater isolation and the greater always stops at the smooth, rough border because it's not an infection that causes the problem that bone loss. Mm -hmm. So it, you have to place the rough, uh, the, the, the polished color above the crest and the rough surface always in the bone level. And if there is no soft tissue infection, you will have a stable bone level over many years. The moment you see mucositis and from the mucositis you have a penetration of the bacteria to the bone level then you have a peri implantitis and then we deal with the issue that was very nicely presented yesterday by my friend frank okay clear clear anything to add i have <laughs> please do <laughs> uh, if you look for the evidence uh, many years ago when we were using no i wouldn't wasn't but who when people was using TPS implant surfaces there was uh, there were a lot of preimplantitis but at that time there was no evidence that TPS surface was creating more preimplantitis than machine surfaces so people will continue to use because they didn't know and there was no evidence here we have in, we are in a similar situation. We are understanding now, not now, but it's just few years that we understood that the rough surfaces are more susceptible to infection than machine surfaces. Yeah, but that's once why they are exposed. That's that's exactly. the condition. Of course. Exactly. But of course. this needs to be, yeah, this exactly. needs to be clarified. Clarified. Yeah. Yeah. Once they get exposed yeah. over the bone level. So if, when we have a rough surface this is, that is completely under the bone or doesn't in the bone, doesn't create any no problem. But it's once it gets thing. exposed, that's the you know plaque accumulation is faster and different. So that's the, the situation. I think. Uh, one? Yeah. No, I just I just want to add that we are uh, Massimo and I we 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 have we arrived to the same conclusion in a completely. Uh, yeah, Milano, uh, Milano from Barcelona is quite far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we arrived to the same. And maybe it's not evidence on the literature, but on, on the clinical, we have seen this difference. We have, we have, uh, I mean, and our patient has suffered from this. And we arrived to the same conclusion. Even when, when you proposed, you gave yesterday a very nice lecture about treatment. Uh, and the, most of the treatments, you convert the rough surface to a polished surface. Why don't install directly uh, a machine a surface, surface? Yes. <laughs> instead of waiting for a bare implantitis. And I totally agree. If, if the su rough surface is not exposed to the oral uh, cavity, no problem. Yeah. Good. The problem arises when yeah. it's exposed. So maybe to, to go back to this answer. Yeah. Um, there is indeed clear evidence that once they are exposed, the progression is much faster. Mm -hmm. So basically, I, I like the idea yeah, to have a, a machine surface subprogressively. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I think we don't have a clear evidence yet because we are just in the beginning. 
but I'm sure in my heart that we will have soon. <laughs> <laughs> we will have soon. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we got to continue working. And with that, I think that's a beautiful uh, uh, bridge because I'm looking at my clock. And as you can, well, you cannot see, we can see around us. This Congress is slowly coming to an end. They're starting to break down the place. Uh, so we need to kind of uh, come to a closing. And I think it's beautiful that you say we still have evidence to find because uh, we have a next Congress, right? Next year. And if you're curious about all the co evidence that's already available, I invite you to check out the online library for the EAO which is normally a members-only so resource. But during Congress, and actually through the rest of the weekend until Monday, you can get a free temporary access. So if you're curious, go to the eao.org website, go to the online library and, and create a temporary access account and browse all the evidence currently available, mm -hmm. and browse all the abstracts, the e-posters that were presented here, and of course, check out the recordings of the sessions like you've just witnessed. And I think with that, we come kind of to the end of this uh, 26th annual scientific meeting here in Madrid, where we look back at 25 years of infant dentistry and what we've learned. And we are starting to look forward to Vienna 2018. If you didn't know yet, mark your calendars, October 11th to 13th in Vienna 2018, where we're going to talk about dreams and reality in implant dentistry. So uh, if you want to be a part of that, start researching, start <laughs> collecting evidence and uh, submit your apps. <laughs> uh, because uh, we would love to see you back in Vienna. With that, my dear speakers, thank you very much for taking the opportunity to uh, take the online questions. My fellow uh, uh, experts, thank you for being with thank us so uh, throughout uh, the show. And to all you online audience members, because we just saw some more sh uh, shout outs come in. German Barrios from Uruguay, Janko Stonovic from Serbia. We have Miguel Romero from uh, the United States University of Iowa. It's amazing to be together with so many professionals from all over the world. Thank you very much for sticking with us through the end. And if you know anybody who might find it interesting to learn more about failing implants and what to do and where the thresholds are, make sure you tag them in the comments or share this video on your timeline on Facebook so everybody in the world can benefit from these latest insights. This conference is coming to a close and what better to do than have a final look back at what happened these last phase, three days in Madrid. We hope to see you next year in Vienna. Bye-bye. Where are you from? Nice in France. I'm from Denmark. I am from Madrid. I come from China. I'm from Norway. We are here a group of uh, around 10 people coming from Jordan. Amazing. It just makes you want to be a much better dentist than we are. Well, some news and uh, a new energy for the, the, the war. It's really amazing. I mean, it's a uh, it's, uh, it's incredible what we are doing now and how we can do the things now with passions. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, yes. It's very exciting to see all the new uh, developments that are occurring and the improvements in the intraoral scanners. The kind of surgery they do here is uh, mind-blowing. Back in our country to do these kind of procedures uh, takes quite an effort and quite a lot of money. But I guess a lot of learning uh, experience here. Uh, the last session was fantastic two great lecturers, uh, they're artists. Anything that you, that you say, okay, I want to try that, I want to do that myself? Not yet. <laughs> I'm so young, but uh, I hope I will do it. I will do it. Basically, this is uh, one great event and uh, extremely amazing happening. I think it was uh, super interesting because they, they talk about topics that um, we need to know about. We need more research about the topics it's always good to, to see uh, uh, other opinions, to get better. Yes, that's it. So cool, you meet a lot of friends, a lot of colleagues, a lot of amazing clinicians, master clinicians, people from whom you can learn a lot, fantastic presentations, and you have the opportunity to network with other people. It's just, it's just fantastic. So I gather you'll be in Vienna then? Of course I will, yeah. To sum up EAO in one word, what would that be? In one word, professionalism. 
digital. The best. Incredible. Danke, dass Sie da waren. Wir haben uns sehr gefreut. Espero que tenham gostado do programa da EAO deste ano. Boa viagem a todos de regresso a casa. Auf Wiedersehen, Servus und ich freue mich, wenn wir uns nächstes Jahr in Wien wiedersehen.